Chapter 10, A Love Prospecting Henry Kidd Douglas, writes Tippy Butler from a 2nd Virginia Infantry Encampment amid the worst winter weather conditions in West Virginia, yet perhaps unable to warm her heart. January 1862, a chilling account of Stonewall soldierhood. A letter from Henry Kidd Douglas to Tippy Boatler, Winchester, January 12, 1862. My dear Miss Tippy, I've been to the Springs since I read your delightful last letter. It may appear to common people as a very peculiar taste, but it is a matter of taste alone, and as I never enjoyed the pleasure of visiting this or that locality in the summer and in time of peace, I did have an opportunity of going to Bath in winter, when everything was gilded with snow. You perceive, therefore, that the one great wish so new to all hearts, that our brigade might not be sent to Romney, was gratified in a very Delphic and to us unsatisfactory manner. But we all stand on a level now. Before this trip, it was a common thing for the members of General Loring's command to remark that it was very true, though Stonewall had seen some hard marching and a goodly share of sharp fighting, but they had never endured the hardships of the mountain bivouac or been exposed to the blasts of western Virginia and its deep snow. They recounted their severe trials, their hairbreadth escapes in wonderful eloquence, until that credulous portion of Christendom, the female sex, listened with admiration and awe, and began, to the chagrin of us Jacksonites, to love them for their dangers they had seen. But we've got even now. They have been compelled to admit that they have endured, within the past two weeks, what they never endured before. With sufficient degree of zeal, we will hereafter be able to hold our share of the sympathies of those who hear of this, the hardest march since those of Napoleon. But it has had a terrible effect upon the troops, as the overflowing hospitals in Winchester attest. About 800 soldiers have been rendered unfit for duty by sickness, and four horse wagons are continually arriving, filled with living evidences of the hardships we have seen. While scores of sick soldiers that cannot be accommodated are being daily sent off to Stanton and other hospitals, I think the sentimentalists who imagine that there is no way to die in war but in battle would be shocked at the sight of those who are expiring without a wound and would feel disposed to modify that Horace quotation, dolce e decorum e pro patria mori, that is, it is sweet and fitting to die for your country. But to begin at the beginning and be as brief as possible, for I have nothing else to write about and may as well fill my letter with a short account of our trip to the Springs, however uninteresting it may prove. About four o'clock on New Year's morning, we were awakened by an untimely reveille and long roll. Every soldier knew before he left his bed that a march was before him in celebration of the advent of 1862. No one knew whither, but a majority dolefully thought of Romney. About daylight we were on the way, puzzling as to our course. The day was pleasant, although rather warm for marching. It was soon evident that the whole army was along and an active expedition was expected. About dark, we bivouacked. Our brigade was placed upon a high hill covered with pine trees resembling the spur of a mountain.
Very soon the winds commenced blowing in real winter blasts and increasing in fierceness, kept it up all night. Our baggage, being in the rear of the whole wagon train, which was about five miles long, did not reach us at all that night, and we were left exposed to the cold, chilly winds without a blanket, many without their overcoats. Pine fires were built, but the smoke and sparks were dashed in all directions so furiously that it was almost impossible to stand near enough to the fires to keep moderately comfortable. Many threw themselves down on the ground, determined to try and sleep amid the smoke and sparks. The consequence was that very few of them escaped without burned clothes. I know I did not. I laid down by the fire and covering my head with the cape of my overcoat, I tried to sleep. I had just succeeded in getting into a nap when I was awakened by a severe shake, and on looking up, found several soldiers engaged in putting out the fire which had caught my overcoat in several places. Satisfied that sleep under the circumstances was impossible, I stood by the fire for the rest of the night, and was duly thankful in the morning that I was still alive. At the sounds of the drum, the march was resumed and continued until about 3 p.m. when we bivouacked until the next morning and commenced the march again. This was a cold, disagreeable day, but we kept up the march until after 10 at night. In the meantime, we had white-spotted evidence that it was going to snow, and to add to the disagreeability of the march, some poor fellows fell in the many runs we crossed after dark, and the ice on their clothes soon reminded one of slain times, only this situation was not quite as comfortable as it might have been in ordinary times. That night, we had more than our quantity of bed clothing, for in putting my head out from under the blankets, whither it had been driven by sleet and snow, I found in the morning about two inches of the old gooseman's geese feathers on top of my bed. I had observed frequently during the night that the snow had penetrated through the small crevices between the blankets and brought itself in very disagreeable contact with my head and face. But I am getting admirably prolix. The next day we entered Bath. And our brigade quartered there for the night. Our camp stayed in a beautiful cottage built by Mr. McGilmer of Bath for a summer residence. And we slept on the spring lawn. It was beautifully furnished. French bedsteads, etc., oil cloth and matting on the floor, innumerable beautiful engravings and some very handsome paintings around the walls, entirely too handsome for soldiers' barracks. I should have preferred a good stable loft, but I'm glad to say nothing was injured, and we left it very early next morning. But we had at least spent one night in Bath, and that in the winter. Did you ever read The Daltons? If so, do you remember the description of Baden, the celebrated German watering place in winter? Well, the resemblance to Bath is clear. To those who live at such a place all the time, the contrast between summer and winter must make either one or the other, according to the fancy, almost unendurable. Just imaginatively repeople Bath with its summer visitors, gauze drapes, bare arms, low necks, light slippers, bare heads, walking through the snow, stepping on ice, 
and watching the white rocks and leafless trees on the barren hill that rises up among the winds and seems to protect Bath. Wouldn't it be a suggestive but strange sight? But we left Bath and went on to the river about four miles. The Yankees had left precipitately from Bath, and owing to the cowardice and inefficiency of the contemptible militia, had escaped us, except about 24 prisoners. However, we got several Yankee storehouses with army stores to the value of thirty or forty thousand dollars. We burned Cape and Bridge and tore up a part of the B and O Railroad. Our camps fared very well in Yankee plunder, some getting jackets, some hats, shoes, etc., and some entering into speculation by selling what they had captured or stolen. But the suffering of the soldiers during these few days, and until the army arrived where it is now, was, was greater, much greater than I had described. Between rain, snow, ice, and cold... It was the valley forge of the revolution, even to the frozen and bleeding feet. I cannot bore you by a description, and even if given it, it would seem almost incredible. One little episode was decidedly interesting to the soldiers. Amid the snow and ice, several messes in our camp regaled themselves with corn and tomatoes, canned, taken from the Yankees, and as delightful and fresh as I have ever seen them in winter. The last march the army took to where it now is was a dreadful one. The road was almost an uninterruptible sheet of ice, rendering it almost impossible for man or beast to travel, while by moonlight the beards of the men, matted with ice and glistening like crystals, presented a very peculiar yet ludicrous appearance. I have not been able to find a man in the second regiment who did not fall down at least twice. I lay down three times. Three men in our brigade broke their arms falling and several rendered their guns useless. Several horses were killed and many wagons were compelled to go into night quarters along the road, being unable to get along at all. Nearly all the march of 18 miles was made after dark, but I'll describe it no further, and but leave the brigade and regiment where it is, about 23 miles from here at Unger's store. How long they will remain there and what they will do next, I know not, although I should not be surprised to see them here before long. Colonel Charles James Faulkner has gone to Richmond for orders. You know, he is one of General Jackson's aide-de-camp. Probably you have asked, what am I doing in Winchester with my company so far away? I arrived here last night. A general court-martial convened by General Johnston meets here tomorrow, of which I am judge advocate, viz. prosecutor for the court, or in other words, it is my duty to prepare and try all the cases brought before it. I have 15 to begin with and will be kept here at least two weeks, probably a month. I was ordered here by General Jackson last night and came with Ned Lee, who is a member of the court. Were it not for the court, I would now be in Shepherdstown, as I could have received a furlough several days ago, but was detained and sent here for duty. I'm certainly not sorry to get away from camp, although the duties of a judge advocate are many and his responsibility great. I will send this letter to you at Shepherdstown, although it is probably from what you said in your last that you are in Lynchburg. Hoping to hear from you very soon with a letter that will rival mine in length, with many good messages to you, Ma, and family. I am yours in inexpressible friendship, Henry Kidd Douglas. <laughs> February 11, 1862, Winchester, Virginia. Sickness rewards Colonel Allen with the welcome trappings of home life. Because of sickness and duties like Douglas at the court martial hearings in the Winchester courthouse, Colonel James Allen, the commander of the 2nd Virginia Infantry, 
enjoyed the comforts of a home there and the presence of his wife, Julia, and their little son, Hugh. In a letter to James' sister, Fanny, Julia wrote, He was taken about ten days ago with a disorder of the stomach and bowels, which he neglected and continued at the courthouse every day through all the rain and mud until he was so weakened as to be forced to stay in and have a doctor. He has now been in bed five days with more or less fever all the time. Though the original disease is controlled, nature seems to be slow in writing herself. He's kept on a very light diet, toast, tea, jelly, and oysters. And by the way, there's no green tea to be gotten in this place. And the coffee, mostly are wholly rye. I wish I could get at some of Mother's stores now. Mr. A won't drink black tea, which is Hobson's choice here. The doctor said he had no fever this morning and thinks he'll be up in a day or two. Mammy came up to me last Saturday and was a great help. Mm -hmm.